Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second day of the fifth Global Moon Village Workshop and Symposium hosted from Nicosia, Cyprus. I'm Christina Shalis, your Master of Ceremonies for the duration of this event. Let us begin with session four, Implementing the Moon Village, a roundtable with industry, academia, civil society, and Q&A. To go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone watching us online around the world. Good afternoon to our panelists of the session four called Implementing the Moon Village. My name is Dovilia Matulevicute and I'm having legal affairs at the Luxembourg Space Agency. I'm also representing Luxembourg at the International Relations Committee of the European Space Agency. And I'm part of the Luxembourg delegation to the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPOS and its legal as well as scientific and technical subcommittees. I would like to thank the Moon Village Association for organizing this session and all the work that they are doing to support the growth and development of a sustainable society and economy on the moon. It's a great pleasure to moderate this panel and to contribute to the public discussion. Before I pass over to the panelists, a few remarks from my side. Um, lunar exploration requires tackling many challenges. We have to think how to move towards the human lunar settlement in the enhanced cooperation and how to create an enabling environment, reconciling the use of space for scientific purposes, commercial use of space and sustainability. The goal of this session is to think about innovative solutions to manage interests of different stakeholders and provide for an incentivizing moon village implementation. For example, environmental aspects should be considered very seriously. We talk a lot about them at the uh, GEXLA, and they shall not be seen as an obstacle at the same time. We should also think about building the bridges between the earth and the space, and we understand that realizing the moon village will be a major step forward for the peaceful development of humankind. Um, when Luxembourg launched uh, Space Resources Dotelu initiative in 2016, we believe that the initiative will contribute to the sustained human presence in space, including the moon and its orbit, and that the moon as the next destination is a very important element to expand human presence beyond the moon. I will not talk more, uh, more about our strategy and policy yesterday, we already talked about, about, about Luxembourg. So today's panel uh, topic, Implementing the Moon Village gathers experienced and renowned speakers contributing to the topic from different perspectives. I had an opportunity to meet almost all of the speakers at GEXLA, um, and we are joined today by uh, Mr. Derek Hodgins, Dr. Alice Gorman, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajaswari Rajagopalan, uh, Dr. Nazar Al Sahab. I will introduce our speakers in a moment. Uh, so each, each of the speakers will have five minutes to share their ideas and thoughts about the implementation of the Moon Village and the future lunar exploration. So let's start our session with uh, Mr. Uh, Hodgins, who is uh, Head of Strategy and Business Development at Lockheed Martin Space, the lunar uh, exploration. Mr. Hodgins, don't hesitate to add any, a few words about yourself and share your thoughts. You have the floor, please. Sure. Thank you. Um... First of all, I kind of feel a little bit inadequate given the fact that uh, I'm surrounded by so many people that have uh, PhDs and uh, I don't have a doctor in front of my name. Um, no, no, I appreciate the opportunity. You're <laughs> you're <not alone. laughs> well, thank you. I feel, much, I feel a little bit better. Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk and appreciate the opportunity to share some insights. We've been working at Lockheed Martin, um, you know, I should say, uh, kind of as a whole and uh, myself uh, looking at lunar infrastructure, looking at the way that we can create, and the, the two words we've used is sustained and sustainable, as far as our presence on the moon, that uh, we're not just uh, going there uh, to, to tour, we're, this is not Apollo, this is something we're going there for, uh, to create that sustained human presence, and also the sustainable human presence in the fact that uh, this kind of crosses number of areas, whether it be uh, financial and given the fiscal constraints we're up against, uh, the environmental, okay, that this has to be something where uh, we're putting up uh, infrastructure that can be reused, infrastructure that uh, is multi-purpose. And we've been spending a considerable amount of time um, on that. Uh, you may have seen last week, we were awarded, uh, along with our partners at Voyager and Nanoracks, a $160 million award for the, uh, the Star Lab concept. 
and uh, which we're uh, um, going to be launching in the, uh, the later part of the 2020s. Now, I talked about something in low Earth orbit, uh, but we're looking at the entire ecosystem of space. And so kind of looking at commercial um, across the board, how does a, uh, a habitat, how does a platform in low Earth orbit enable the moon? And along those lines, the way that we're working in inflatables, you may have seen in the, um, uh, in the announcement, inflatable habitats, how does that, as we develop these for Earth orbit, able to be uh, used for, uh, for the lunar surface without adding development and development costs. So we're looking at entire ecosystem of it. Uh, you know, Part of one of my passion projects is our partnership with uh, General Motors, uh, developing our lunar mobility vehicle. Um, this kind of goes with that whole sustained and sustainable presence uh, mobility is that foundational capability for the surface. And we've used the, uh, the term, everything that lands on the moon needs to have wheels, or it could also be said that everything that lands on the surface needs to be positionable. And this goes for everything from logistics and cargo, the way you support the, uh, the crew, uh, you know, how you uh, transport power stations as you land those high value elements on the moon, whether they be habitats, nuclear reactors, ISRU plants, all of these things need to be relocatable because as we move from one site to another, uh, these are things you don't want to throw out. Um, even when you start talking about uh, the, the crew interaction, uh, NASA's talked about a lunar train vehicle, which is one week of use for the first mission, two weeks of use for the follow-on missions. And the way, we're looking at, the way we're looking at mobility is the 26 weeks when the sun is up, and even what can you do the 26 weeks that the sun is down? And that kind of contributes to, uh, to those two presence, um, you know, that sustained and sustainable human presence. So we're, uh, you know, appreciate the opportunity to talk here. I, we, we look at this as the, as the first step of many, many steps. You have to start somewhere. And uh, we're looking at the, uh, the roadmap of how do we get from here to uh, landing that first vehicle to the end of 2030 to 2040 to 2050 and create that uh, that sustainable presence, sustained human presence, uh, you know, off into the foreseeable future. And that really goes towards what we see as the ultimate destination being Mars. But really, this is an ecosystem of, across the two that one enables the other and, uh, you know, phenomenal opportunities ahead of us. So we appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate. Thank you, Derek, and congratulations with the Starlab contract. Um, so I will move now to our next speaker, Associate Professor Alice Gorman from Flinders University, Australia. Professor Gorman is an internationally recognized leader in the field of space archaeology and heritage of space exploration, including space junk, planetary landing sites, off-Earth mining, and space habitats. She is also an author of uh, the award-winning book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, Archaeology and the Future. Professor Gorman is also a vice chair of GEXLA, Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, and a member of the Advisory Council um, of the Space Industry Association in Australia. And there is another fact that I cannot miss. In 2021, asteroid 551014 Gorman was named after her in recognition of her work in establishing space archaeology as a field. Professor Gorman, I know that you have many things to say, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dervale, and it's uh, such a um, pleasure to be part of this panel. I was madly scribbling notes while Derek was speaking, um, and I might pick up on some of those points um, in what follows. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that I speak to you from the lands of the Wiradjuri people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge their continuing connection to the cultural heritage of their lands, waters and skies. And I also extend my respects to the traditional owners of the lands that you're all joining us from today. So to situate myself, I'm an academic, but I've also been a professional heritage consultant who's spent many years working in mining industry on Earth. And this has very much informed my perspectives about lunar activity. What I want to talk to you about on this panel today uh, is the work of the Australian eco-feminist philosopher Val Plumwood, which I think is incredibly relevant for the Moon Village's core vision of the growth and development of a sustainable society on the Moon. So in 1985, Plumwood had an extraordinary experience. She was attacked by a crocodile while canoeing alone in Kakadu National Park. She fought the crocodile off three times and survived, 
but it had quite a profound effect on her philosophy. It brought home to her the existence of an external reality in which our perceptions are irrelevant. And as she described it, this near-death experience gave her a glimpse from the outside of the alien, incomprehensible world in which the narrative of self has ended. So as a result of this experience, she came up with an approach to working in the world which she called co-participation, in which the natural environment was not something to be mastered or used, but something that humans worked together with. A key element of this co-participation approach is the concept of dependency. Plumwood argued that there was a cultural failure to understand human dependence on the life-giving systems of nature, and this was a direct cause of the non-sustainable use of natural resources on Earth. In fact, she wasn't even thinking about the moon or space at all at this stage. Not only this, dependencies make humans vulnerable, but it tends only to be at crisis points that, that this dependence is foregrounded, so often when it's getting too late to almost do anything about it. And finally, Plumwood argued, and I quote, the inability or refusal to recognize the way non-humans contribute to or support our lives then encourages us to starve them of resources. So I'm interested in what happens when we apply this model of co-participation to the moon. So one aspect of this, it's often a stated fact, fact that the moon is dead. And this is talked about as if it's self-evident and indisputable. As Plumwood describes it, this is the idea of nature as dead matter, uh, which, to which some separate driver has to add life, organisation, intelligence and design. I'll quote it from her again. So this, it seems to me, is very much how people tend to view the moon right now. Humans justify their presence by the old colonial rationale that conquest brings improvement, that they're injecting sentience into a formerly dead being. In the co-participation model, by contrast, we have to acknowledge that the moon is no longer a passive body to which humans do things. It actually has its own existence and agency. So then through the co-participation lens, we have to identify those dependencies and vulnerabilities. So this might mean, for example, water ice and water, which is necessary to sustain human life and also to grow the lunar economy. And this is the rationale that we have for proposing more sustained settlement, as Derek has said. So this water ice, it's a resource, but it also makes us vulnerable, particularly as we have a very imperfect understanding of lunar water cycles. We, we don't yet know how renewable water on the moon is. And we could also perhaps say that night and dust are lunar qualities that make us vulnerable too. So following on from this, we might then ask, what does the moon need from us in order to survive? So there's another unstated assumption that without living ecosystems and atmospheres and oceans and all of that stuff, that the moon is somehow less complex than Earth, hence more understandable and less vulnerable to damage. And in fact, we don't know any of these things. We don't know what the moon's vulnerabilities are yet. We only know something of ours. So my final thought about this is, is how this might translate into action. And I think this comes down to a matter of priorities. So before figuring out how we use the resources of the moon, we need to study and understand these points of vulnerability, both for humans and for the moon itself. So to wrap up, I'd like to um, read you a quote from the poet and writer Keridwan Dovey from her poem, Moonrise, which actually gives the moon a voice. I am made of much more disturbing stuff, seas of death, bays of lunacy, craters of indifference to human time. That's it from me. Thank you, Alice, that was really nice. Um, so now I will um, move to another panelist, Dr. Rajaswari Rajagopalan who is the director of the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Raja Gopalan was the technical advisor to the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts on Prevention of Armed Race in Outer Space. She, is, she also co-authored and edited a number of books and pub publications. 
She is one of the vice chairs of the Gexler, like Alice. So Raja, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Dovil. And uh, you can call by my short name, Raji. <laughs> my full name is literally a tongue twister. Uh, again, thank you uh, so much uh, for the opportunity to be um, MBA Moon Village Association. Uh, for this opportunity to be part of this conversation, looking at the um, sort of uh, the Luna missions, Moon Village uh, implementation. And in, in a sense, I'm maybe digressing from the two previous presentation and looking at another aspect of the, uh, the Luna missions, the lunar activities that uh, the states and other stakeholders are involved in. So it's been now more than uh, 50 years since the humans set their foot on the moon for the first time in 1969. But today, the major power space exploration, major space explorations are no longer limited to the two or three players that we saw during the Cold War years or even after that. A lot of China and India, for instance, have been pushing their moon missions with their Chang'e 4 missions and Chandrayaan missions. Uh, China's Chang'e 4 spacecraft landed on the far side of the moon, a major achievement uh, for the entire man, humankind in pushing the limits of lunar exploration. But it's also a stark reminder of the geopolitical competition and rivalry that are increasingly driving these missions. In a sense, what we are seeing today is a repeat of history. 50 years ago, what we saw with the US and Soviet Union undertaking several different launches with a sense of pride and patriotism than science as the key driver. Uh, they were, uh, there was a lot of deep political significance, and in fact, it was the extension of the balance of power politics on Earth that was on display in space as well. And I believe that we are back in the same space now with a few additional actors like India, China, Japan, and others who have their growing aspirations driving their uh, upcoming uh, lunar missions. Scientific discovery and space space have become important collaterals, but it is the sense of competition achieving at, in, in achieving a technological edge that is driving these programs in a sense. So looking at the fresh momentum for space exploration, including lunar missions, the US, for instance, came up with the new agreement for lunar exploration uh, called the Artemis Accords, a set of principles that will steer growing human activities in the moon from whether it is in terms of mining resources to setting up lunar bases, colonies, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is, of course, an agreement for lunar exploration and beyond with participation of both international partners as well as commercial players, which we have not seen before in many ways. Really. Uh, and of course, there are a dozen countries that are already become parties to it, signatories to the um, uh, to the Artemis Accords. Many of these were nations where in, you need to remember that they were the margins of space exploration a few, even a few years ago. But today they have developed the technological wherewithal to visit the moon, return with lunar samples and so on and so forth. Similarly, uh, seeking to develop somewhat an alternative international partnership model, China and Russia have come up with the International Lunar Research Station proposals, and the two countries are currently looking at uh, other countries and international organizations to join this endeavor. Uh, this was uh, recently announced at the, uh, at the COPUS in April, and the two countries and their respective space agencies are pushing um, this proposal to gain greater salience in a sense. But I think it's also important to understand uh, how does this put a lot of the different countries into place. Uh, it is reasonable to expect that countries are going to support uh, either the Artemis Accords or the ILRS based on their political leanings for more than the merits of each proposal. So how do we create cooperative arrangements between these two initiatives? Is it possible for the ILRS and the Artemis Accords to uh, create some sort of a cooperative arrangement, some sort of a, co a collaborative uh, mechanism uh, between some of these mechanisms? Uh, uh, between these two proposals, for instance. Uh, nevertheless, I would say this competition that we see today in lunar uh, activities is also giving way to cooperative ventures on a smaller scale between, for instance, between countries like India and Japan, who are pursuing a joint lunar mission called LUPEX. Um, uh, groupings like the Quad, for instance, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which involves uh, countries like India, US, Australia, and Japan, are also pursuing larger or broader space cooperation, but they're all small exclusive groupings, which can, in a sense, I would say, maybe weaken some of the multilateral processes. 
Uh, they also have that this, on the other hand, the potential to generate some sort of consensus and gradually this cooperation can be extended to bigger platforms that can make, make for a way for meaningful cooperation in space. But the bigger point I want to make here is that the kind of competition that we see today is a wasteful, a wasteful endeavor in a sense. It is much better if these countries could collaborate. Uh, it becomes important in the context when countries are facing shortage in terms of financial resources or even the technologies, some of the technologies involved are uh, uh, complex. So in a sense, technology cooperation, if these countries can come together and work together, it can be beneficial in many ways. One is, of course, mindful of the uh, number of different challenges and problems in terms of collaboration. The most important of this is the, of course, the geopolitical rivalry. And the way out of this is for states to recognize that space is a common asset of humankind and that we need to recognize that space competition could potentially risk all of the benefits that, uh, that come from the use of space. Uh, even though everybody benefits from space, this current competition is, at, it could be at for putting all of us at risk in a sense. So initiatives such as the Moon Village Association, as well as Gexla, the global, uh, global expert group on sustainable lunar activities, these are necessary because these these are multi-stakeholder initiatives involving all the different stakeholders from the government and industry to academia and civil society. And only through such initiatives can we ensure that the benefits of space are not harmed um, and that everyone stands to gain. Measures like these are significant investments in the processes, for instance, to create or to enhance trust and confidence in each other, which has become a major casualty from the current state of competition and rivalry. Therefore, space powers, and I don't mean the top two or three or four or five players, but because almost all the countries around the world are invested in and benefit from space one way or the other. So we need to bring all of these countries together. They need to contemplate the global governance challenges and how we can make progress. We need to think about the sharing benefits. We need to think about information sharing, environmentally sustainable use of space, use of lunar space. Uh, and this may not happen uh, very uh, easily uh, within formal traditional multilateral platforms at this point of time. So NGOs like the MBA, for instance, have a big role in changing the nature and content of conversations to make countries get into the habit of cooperation, cooperating with each other, have meaningful conversations, at least as a starting point. Um, so I think collaboration, information sharing, transparency, these are important and these may not happen readily at uh, multilateral platforms at this point of time, given the state of the geopolitical competition. And therefore we need to start at uh, places like, spaces like MBA, Gexla, these are the kind of platforms that must be used because these are multi-stakeholder. Every single investor, every single uh, party that is invested in this, in this regard is part of this conversation. So I think uh, we, need to, uh, we need more of such conversations to happen and make progress in a way that is beneficial for the entire humankind. Let me stop there and I'll be happy to hear thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Raje. Yesterday, when Professor, um, when, when, um, Professor Green and Mr. Warner, they said something very interesting that from space, we don't see the borders on the Earth anymore. And I think that this is something very significant to understand that you know, uh, different tensions, geopolitical tensions, they will always exist. But when we are there, you know, we, when we are in the space, we have the common goal to succeed. Yes. Exactly. And I agree with you that you know groups like Gexler, they're extremely important. You know they're inclusive, they're open to all stakeholders, and they provide so, so much needed and valuable contribution to international fora like Corpus. Yeah, very very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the final the final panelist who will provide a slightly another perspective. So Professor Nazar Al Sahav from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Professor Al Sahaf is well known in the space science field, and especially, I would like to specifically, I would like to mention his research contributing to what is known today as the cupola in the International Space Station. Among Dr. Al Sahaf's accomplishments during his tenure at King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology is the establishment of the National Center for Science Geodesy and Space Geodesy, sorry, and the continuous operating geodetic network. In 2015, he served as expert advisor to Moon Express. Then in 2018, tenured as special advisor to the Royal Private Affairs Office of the custodian of the two Moholy Mosques. Professor Al Zahaf is a member of the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, and um, he chairs uh, a subgroup on responsible governance. 
So, Professor Al Zahab, the floor is yours. Thank you, Durville, and thank you, Raji. And I would like to follow up on, uh, take a cue from uh, Raji, and um, I will uh, talk about, uh, in my view, the importance of this discussion is to define the need for all nations to cooperate and complement each other in the field of space exploration, developing nations' contribution and ultimately their success towards space exploration is conditional upon their true inclusion uh, within the space industry. Uh, developed nations, in my view, have a succinct obligation to open the door to include developing nations. One way to go forward uh, and realize this feat is uh, for developed nations to identify a list of essential programs uh, for space exploration in concert with their own actively pursued programs. Uh, the developing nations would pick uh, and choose an appropriate program um, uh, from the list to complement existing but essential efforts and work uh, with together towards a common goal. This should be done with strong mechanisms in place to discourage uh, what uh, I consider frivolous competition and what Raji uh, mentioned um, uh, as far as the, um, uh, the competition, uh, especially stuff with uh, no uh, apparent scientific value. Um, as a member of Gixla and on this stage, I call upon developed nations uh, with well-established space programs uh, to consider seriously publishing a list of all necessary venues for the explicit purpose of inclusion of developing nations. Uh, once this list is published, a developing nation may go into a pairing of sorts based upon their unique capabilities, national aspirations, resources, and own agenda with a specific um, uh, space farming nation and work together in harmony to complement each other's work and achieve the desired success uh, while at the same time enhance enacting the the concept of capacity building which is very important for uh, developing nations this will result in a more viable formula for sustainable space programs benefiting all humankind also benefits of such uh, cooperative programs uh, does not stop here, um, but also fosters greater international cooperation and provides a true mechanism uh, of the much needed uh, transfer of technologies, which has eluded developing nations so far. Uh, and undoubtedly cast a positive worldview on space exploration and help limit frivolous adventures without any scientific or added value to the current state of the art uh, or science uh, or applications, nor any real value to humankind. Uh, I look to my own region as an example of a developing nation that has done work in this field of space uh, exploration. But from the new initiative I am proposing from this stage could provide synergetic benefits to both developing and space-faring nations for the greater good of all humanity. Uh, the Kingdom of, of Saudi Arabia is a developing nation with high aspirations to benefit its people and catapult the country into the 22nd century through aggressive and visionary strategies, namely Vision 2030 and humankind. Uh, of course, KSA is not new to space exploration. For example, Saudi Arabia goes back more than 40 years when a compatriot became the first Arab Muslim to go into space as a payload specialist aboard the space shuttle Discovery. And we can also include my team's research while I worked at NASA Ames Research Center, which later resulted in significant added value to science by benefiting the design of the International Space, uh, International space Station to this day. Both of these contributions uh, would not be complete without mention of the earlier collaboration between the King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology and NASA 
in what became the only laser ranging observatory in the Middle East, tracking satellites 24,000 kilometers deep into space. Case A, uh, the kingdom is also poised to lead as it has adopted yet another aspect of the moon, the lunar calendar as its official calendar since its inception as a nation in 1936 by the founder of the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the late King Abdulaziz Al Saud. This proposal to the developed nations to include developing nations in their quest to reach the stars could not come at a more opportune time with rising international interest in space exploration through what Gexler has identified as information sharing, safe operations and lunar environmental protection, compatibility and interoperability, responsible governance. And all, with all of these, uh, this is how we will have uh, collaboration uh, between nations and using platforms such as Gexler and MVA, the Moon Village Association. And with that, I respectfully turn the floor over to Duvel. Thank you. Thank you, Nazar. I completely understand your concern about the involvement of the developing countries in the quest for, for the moon and uh, the space exploration. And you know, benefit sharing is a very complicated topic. There are many different ways to share the benefits, but probably for the countries which are still building their capacity, um, it's not so much about monetary sharing of those benefits, but it's really about learning from bigger countries with very strong capacities and being involved, even, you know, maybe in a very niche areas, uh, just to learn and you know, to, to, to grow with the time. So many thanks to all the speakers for sharing their point of view, um, which are very, very complimentary, I find. So now let's move to the roundtable discussion. I have a few questions and to know if you have any question, you can also ask each other. Um, so I just would like to remind that we have some time constraints and we shall finish exactly at 4 p.m. sharp. Um, so listening to your interventions, um, you mentioned so many different points which shall be addressed in the future. Uh, framework for, for lunar activities, you know, about which we should discuss and talk. Um, we know that we, it will be impossible to tackle all different points at once. Um, and um, Jan Werner yesterday, he said something very interesting, and I think that it's also very right for us, for the lawyers, <laughs> that regulatory framework, it will take so much time to, to, to achieve, you know, the common, common rules, common ground rules, but what do we do in the meantime? Somehow we have to advance and we have to start doing those activities in the right way. So I'm wondering what key elements shall we address in the implementation of the Moon Village in the short term, the most urgent, then in the medium term and long term? So maybe I will start from um, Derek because I think that Derek, he wanted to leave also a little bit earlier. So just from commercial perspective, what is your point of view with regard to the most um, urgent and you know less urgent issues to, to in the implementation of the moon village, please. Or Derek already left. Oh, I think we lost him. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, he, he just warned us that he will have to leave a little, a little bit earlier. So Alice, I will turn to you now. Any thoughts from your side? Uh, well, I think you may, well, first of all, I'm going to pick up on something you said earlier in reference to a, a previous session in which someone had said, um, you know, f viewed from space, you see no borders on Earth. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth pointing out that at this present time, there are no borders on the moon. So it's not that we don't see them, they literally do not exist. And we're about to enter into a phase where they might not be national borders, but in which we are going to demarcate areas of the moon according to terrestrial legal principles, according to um, what people are actually doing on the surface um, and probably with increased sort of geological and geographic knowledge as well. So the moon is, the nature of the moon is going itself uh, is, is going to be rapidly changing. And in that gap, which you mentioned between a fully developed kind of regulatory framework 
and the the problem of just like getting on with things in the meantime. I think this comes back to what NASA was talking about, which is this the, the urgent step is to have a much greater involvement both in working on projects uh, because of, of, you know, capacity building and sort of general participation and inclusiveness, and also in having those voices at the table when decisions are being made about um, what that regulatory framework for the moon is going to be. And I think the, the, the Gagsler's work, the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities, um, is a, a key component of this. And by the time, you know, we do have somebody or, or some people sort of on the surface of the moon doing things, we will have, we'll have many sets of sort of high level principles. Um, the Gegsler, of course, is going to be going into to some nitty gritty detail as well in terms of how people act. But uh, as a sort of an, an urgent step, and this is something that uh, is frequently spoken of, we do need to get these, these other nations and organisations around the table. And from the Australian side, I, I think our priority ought to be liaising with our uh, Pacific Island neighbours, who everybody just leaves out. You know, it, it is assumed that there is nothing um, spacey going on there but I actually think it's critical that uh, we start engaging at that level. So those are my thoughts on, I suppose that's sort of thinking short term or shorter term, but with implications and benefits that run into the much longer term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this will be also very important for small countries and also for the private companies because, you know, they also have to think how they can contribute to those projects. It's not only about, you know, getting uh, explicitly involved, but it's also like, you know, what can we bring, what private company can bring, what those countries can bring, you know, we don't have probably to compete with, with each other, but we have to find the synergies. So, Nazar, I will turn to you. Any remarks from your side? Oh, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Thank you. Um, I would comment that um, uh, there are uh, some uh, collaborations, uh, but uh, not um, actually uh, in concert with what's going on. Uh, we have um, some developed nations with uh, a large history of uh, uh, of space uh, exploration for the past 50, 30 years or so. And, uh, and we have yet uh, other nations who are just starting and um, uh, there doesn't seem to be any um, um, synergy between what everybody's doing. And it seems that uh, as, uh, as uh, Raji explained before and, and as Alice mentioned, that uh, some of the uh, competition could uh, fire back uh, because of wasted resources and efforts. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to work uh, collaboratively. And uh, the list that I propose from the platform using Gexlag as a platform, Moon Village Association platform, uh, is to actually consider seriously by the space farming nations um, a list of all the uh, programs that are essential to their own work. But um, as we all know, uh, space exploration is very expensive. And so while they're um, concentrating on something very high tech uh, that uh, a, a developing nation uh, would not be able to um, uh, provide uh, because they need to build their capacity first, um, maybe they can do some of the ancillary uh, research or work or program or, or find a niche that they can actually support the ongoing uh, programs. And that way everybody will share in the success because the resources will be directed uh, towards uh, uh, a comprehensive program rather than each nation doing its own program. 
And this will also cut away on the frivolous activities that or programs that are um, not cost effective, but at the same time, they may um, uh, have a media uh, extravaganza, but not any uh, succinct or real uh, scientific value to add. Thank you. Can I just ask, Nasa, which, in your opinion, well, if you feel comfortable saying this, what are the frivolous lunar projects that you're referring to? Well, I'm no, just talking in, general, if you don't want in, in, in I'm just in general, I'm saying in general yeah. that um, if it's not something, I mean, space programs, you have to study them, you have to have a strategy, a long term strategy uh, for the next 20 years, 30 years, whatever. So each of the developing nations should uh, carefully consider what uh, they want to achieve in 20 years or 30 years, and not just what, what they want to do now for the case of uh, a public event or something like that. Um, so that will help with a sustainable uh, space program. If you, um, I, take, I take, for example, um, the, the race for space between uh, the Soviet Union in the late 50s and the US. Um, the Soviet Union was the first to reach space with Sputnik. Um, and then after that, of course, the, it became during the Cold War, a race to space and uh, for political reasons. And then uh, the United States put a man on the moon. And then what happened? Nothing. Uh, until now, from that day until now, nothing happened. Now that's more than 50 years ago you would expect that at least by now we would have some. So that is what I consider that the developing nations should uh, heed and, and, and learn from past mistakes by space farming nations and not fall into that uh, and, and only decide, okay, we're going to go to the moon or wherever but this is the strategy. This is the step. This is what we're going to be here in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years and, and have those resources towards that. And with collaboration uh, with the developed uh, nations uh, who have uh, a lot of experience in space uh, programs and uh, exploration, I think that's the way to go. That's the more sustainable way to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Nasa. That makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate your point on sustainability because it's not only from an environmental perspective, but it's also how as the humanity we advance in those activities. The Cold War is over. The, you know, we don't have anymore only two space powers. There are also emerging space powers, space nations. And we have to somehow those probably big missions undertaken by bigger countries in, in that framework, you know, it would be very interesting to think about the niches where others could contribute, you know, not probably. Uh, as much as the big countries with their you know, advantage in time uh, and the different knowledge they accumulated over, over the years. So it seems also that we need a, a bigger policy goal. Like as a humanity, what do, we, what do we want to achieve? What do we want to do? So probably it would be, could be just a very simple statement, um, like common goal for us all guiding all those discussion, legal discussions, or you know, even the implementation of different aspects like inter interoperability and so on. So Raji, I will turn to you. So from your perspective, what are the key uh, elements we should address you know, in a short, uh, short term, medium or long term? The floor is yeah. here. Yeah, uh, thanks Dovelene. I think I agree with a lot of the comments uh, made by both Nasser and Alice. And I think the, we need to have a least common denominator approach to uh, when we talk about uh, developing a global governance or rules and regulations kind of things, because the kind of difficulties that we have seen so far uh, in developing an overarching uh, sort of a treaty or a, or some other agreement hasn't gone very far in a sense. So at least can we get a few minimal points on the agenda if countries and other stakeholders can agree upon 
and start some basic cooperation. I think basically getting their countries and other stakeholders to get into the habit of cooperation, I think that itself is a great start. And here again, I would emphasize also on the process issue in a sense, inclusive process. I think that needs to be emphasized because everyone wants to have a say in how global rules will be developed. It's no more like the 60s and uh, 70s when two or three powers were engaged in this exercise and rest of them, rest of everybody fell into uh, fell in line with the whatever measures were agreed upon by those two powers in a sense. That's no more the uh, um, no more the scenario in a sense. So we need to have an inclusive process where, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> um, uh, because I think there are genuine fears among the, a number of developing countries about how, for instance, new roles will be detrimental to the, their efforts at developing their space program, including in lunar space, um, that will be against their interests in terms of technology collaboration. So I think the you know, whatever new conversations we are having, uh, we need to emphasize on technology transfer, technology cooperation, especially for the developing countries and uh, uh, as an important aspect of conversation when, while uh, talking about developing new rules and regulations. And I think that can be a huge message of reassurance uh, to the developing countries, uh, which in a sense can translate into uh, a sort of a critical support base for new regulations and kind of things. So I think uh, one is the uh, one is, for instance, I think first thing we need to have a least common denominator approach so that we can uh, come up with a few important um, agenda points first. Uh, to start with, uh, in a sense. Second is the inclusive process. Third, I think we also need to have uh, sort of information. You talked about interoperability. I think that's an important aspect, especially uh, given that space is expensive, technology is very complex, so collaboration makes sense. But I think it also calls for immediately uh, is, uh, questions like uh, interoperability, information sharing, and how do we uh, share the benefits that we gain from lunar activities? I think these are points that we need to bring about, but I think that would also require some bit of trust and confidence in each other, which can come from, uh, in a short term at least, uh, confidence building measures that we need to take up uh, before um, uh, as a first starting point in a sense. And I think that can uh, sort of uh, lead a uh, way forward for other uh, more binding agreements in the longer term. So we actually, we need a constructive approach, very constructive approach in order to approach those benefit sharing issues because it's not obvious neither for us how to solve it, neither probably for those nations who already developed their capabilities. And, and so, you know, you, Alice also talked about terrestrial mining. So learning, from those different activities like, you know, terrestrial mining with very high environmental impact on Earth, or even, you know, more recent experience on the International Space Stations. So what lessons or what solutions we could apply in order to advance and succeed in Moon Village and, you know, the lunar exploration in general? Raji, if, if you would like just to continue. Yeah, uh, so International Space, uh, space uh, ISS is a, is, a, is, a great, uh, is a great example of international collaboration in the International Space Station. Uh, but again, it is since still a smaller number of countries. But the fact is that you have countries like Russia and the United States, even through very difficult times, they have navigated their cooperation in this particular area. And this is something that has remained an important aspect of their um, uh, sort of their relationship. So again, I think this could be, and that's why I would say that the Artemis Accords earlier, for instance, we talked about, I talked about in my initial remarks, as well as the, we have the International Lunar Resource Station, ILRS. So how do we combine? These could be complementary in nature. These could be, there could be cooperative mechanisms that we can bring about in a sense. So how do we because one, it is uh, financially, it makes sense. Second, uh, given the complexity of the technologies involved, again, it makes sense for country, major powers to come together in collaboration. And finally, the NASA's point about sustainable use of um, the lunar space. I think that's, again, a very, very important aspect if we have to talk about the future generation's ability to use uh, lunar space in an, in, a, in an effective fashion. So I think all of this, in a sense, makes sense for cooperative kind of approaches and uh, these need to happen. But I think we need to have, we need to start a new narrative because competition and the geopolitical rivalry cannot be the entirely, uh, cannot be the entire narrative that is kind of uh, driving our conversation. So I think we need to start a new narrative where cooperative agenda involving the multiple stakeholders involved and benefits of these need to be talked about 
much or more of much more often than uh, what we do otherwise at this point of time and of course thank you thank you Rajin. Alice, turning to you you have very interesting experience also in the terrestrial mining so what lessons uh, we could learn and what kind of mechanisms we could take from our experience on earth well in terrestrial mining now you've got you know the results of decades and decades of development of environmental impact assessment processes and I'd be the last person to claim that these work perfectly on Earth. They, they don't, but they do actually prevent a lot of needless environmental destruction. And you do hear people talk sometimes, uh, well, well, first of all, there's this idea that, in fact, there is no environment on the moon because there's nothing, there's no living ecosystems on the moon. So I think we have to abandon that idea, just get rid of that idea. It doesn't serve us well. Um, and the idea that, um, you know, the, 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 the rules of the road can be worked out in the process of doing them. So that is a recipe for disaster. We actually have to have things in place uh, before we start doing that. And I think we can actually adopt a lot of stuff directly from that environmental impact um, framework that will work uh, very well on the moon. And maybe we can even improve uh, on some of the issues uh, that we find when we do these things on Earth. So, so I think I think there there is a lot to be learned about how, learnt about how to do these things well. I think a critical aspect of this is is uh, the social license to operate, which is increasingly being adopted uh, in terrestrial mining, and this means having community support continuously. So it's not just an approvals process you, that that a company. Uh, seek support from the, the local or the relevant community on an ongoing basis uh, to get support for their activities. So, and this isn't necessarily a legal thing because, because it's all about community relations. But what is the community that we are seeking the social licence to operate from? It is the entire population of Earth. And this, I think, brings us back to the importance of benefit sharing as well, which does tend, so in the Australian example is that any, you know, mining company um, has to um, have measures in place to support the local traditional owners. And this often is not done in a sustainable way. It's done to tick boxes and it's done over and over again, the same things over and over again, and Indigenous communities are not actually left better off in the long run. They don't they don't cumulatively um, uh, uh, get more benefits by engaging with mining. So I think we have some lessons of what not to do uh, from these contexts um, as well. And just quickly, um, I think the International Space Station is a really interesting example of cooperation uh, because a lot of the time it doesn't actually work very well either. My favourite example of this is in 2009 when um, the cosmonauts were forbidden from using the NASA toilets. And this was a purely political decision that had no practical benefit. Uh, everybody complained about it. That's just one example of terrestrial politics actively preventing cooperation at the very basic level of what people do day to day in the International Space Station. So it's a great example of international cooperation at one level. In other ways, it is a terrible example of international cooperation. Hmm. Yeah, I, I find that aspect of the social license to operate very interesting. Probably, you know, we should seriously think how to adapt it to the space environment and to you know space exploration because not everything, not all circumstances are the same. So. So Nazar, I will turn to you because you know I, I, I was thinking somehow you are a very good example of, of international cooperation because you had an opportunity to work with NASA to, to do research, you know, which contributed also to the International Space Station. So from what is your perspective? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think it can be done because uh, when I... Um, worked at NASA Ames, uh, before I worked there, I assumed that um, uh, it was all just all Americans, all, um, you know, one type of scientists uh, from one part of the world. But uh, when I actually worked there, 
I realized that uh, it was um, a mix of all nationalities there, all working uh, for the same objective, and that is finding solutions for a space exploration. And um, uh, if, if that is the case, um, that's with human reactions, you know, on a, on a personal basis and with the, your colleagues and your team members, then uh, I don't see how that could be not achieved on a larger scale with international cooperation. Uh, again, there are a lot of um, uh, nations who would like to enter the field of space exploration, but of course, maybe they're held back by the awe of what uh, uh, the space farming nations have already achieved, uh, reaching the moon, reaching Mars, and, and landing um, uh, spacecraft and returning samples. Uh, but in, at the end, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of uh, regular people that are all working together as a team for humankind. And that's how we should always uh, look into that. Uh, at the very last, I would like to mention or pick up on a comment that Alice made just now about um, um, the, the governance. And, and I would say that's why Gexla um, wisely inserted a, a subcommittee on responsible lunar governance. And so that in the future, hopefully through arms like this and through this platform and uh, discussions and, and, and researching this and, and providing uh, suggestions uh, to COPUS at the United Nations, then maybe we can come up with uh, regulations uh, that will uh, set this standards for uh, lunar responsible uh, governance. Um, another item I wanted to mention, which we did not uh, touch upon, but it's very important, is the space debris mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, so we do not uh, trash the moon as we have done in low earth orbit here on earth. Uh, it is important that uh, this issue, which is also one of Gexler's important aspects for study, that uh, all uh, future uh, explorations and uh, space five nations should take that into consideration so that we would not have the same problem there because it's so idyllic and nice and clean now. We should uh, pay a lot of attention to that. So we are running out of time. Thank you to all the panelists for such an interesting dis discussion, you know, to raising your concerns, also finding the solutions. And I have one wish for uh, Moon Village implementation. I hope that the future Moon Village will be as inclusive and as diverse as our panel today. Gender-wise, country-wise, you know, we're all coming and discussing about these issues from very different countries, from this very different backgrounds. Um, and at the same time, it's also very inclusive, you know, we are prepared to listen to each other and you know, to, to look for those solutions. So this is what I desire for our future cooperation and implementation. So let's make it happen one day. <laughs> uh, so thank you, thank you all, and I wish you all uh, the nice day. Bye bye. Thank you, Jovale. Thank, Thank you, Jovale. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. <laughs>
Welcome back from our breakout session. We now have a short commercial break with messages from our esteemed sponsors. Our purpose in this life is a precious gift. This gift is often waiting to be unearthed in the why of what we do and believe. Our purpose is found in the why of protecting what matters most. The town of Newcastle, Oklahoma is giving credit to an early warning severe weather forecast system for saving countless lives. Sir, our satellite alerted us to an avalanche. It's imaging the area and tracking heat signatures of potential victims. Sending updates now. Our purpose is found in the why of connecting to each other around town and around the world. And the U.S. Space Force continues to modernize today's GPS satellite constellation with new, more powerful GPS-3 satellites. General, this is Air Force One. We will be connecting you to a secure line to the President shortly. Stand by, One. And our purpose is found in the why of exploring what lies beyond. NASA's InSight Lander has measured the first ever Mars quake inside the Red Planet. OSIRIS-REx completed a daring two-year mission, studying and collecting a pristine sample from the asteroid Bennu. Scientists are hoping to discover insight into the origin of our solar system. Our why inspires us to protect, connect, and explore today and for generations to come. It's really something else. I can't believe we're here. Unearthed long ago, the why is what gives us our purpose a mission to advance the human race into the dawn of a new space age. Mars Base Camp, this is Lunar Control. You are a go. You're cleared to proceed to Mars. Go make history. Throughout history, Mankind has seen its future written in the stars. Today, that vision of the future is a reality, one which transcends borders. In Luxembourg, we believe in the visionaries and the makers. Here, we support the future space economy as it grows and develops. Investing in people. Encouraging research and development. And providing access to financial solutions. Luxembourg stands behind the ones who make and do. Each day brings new ideas and discoveries. We build the tools and provide the services that enable us to grasp our future. Home to the global leader in satellite communications, we operate a unique constellation of satellites that encircles the world. We analyze data gathered from the vastness of space. And we nurture a growing, sustainable commercial space ecosystem. One that connects billions of people, businesses and everyday objects anywhere at any time. An ecosystem that allows us to understand what's happening on our planet. Helps us explore new frontiers and extend Earth's economy into deep space. Here we believe in the entrepreneurs the scientists and engineers who put the universe within our reach. This is what makes Luxembourg the place for space development.
For centuries, it's been a gateway between East and West, between past and present, between cultures old and new. Between tradition and transgression. Between ambition and execution. Between government and industry. Between nations, between giants and those who aspire to be, between talent and opportunity. Between aspiration. and foundation. Between science and nature. Between intimacy and community. Today, Nicosia is a gateway into the future. A gateway to new world-class developments. A gateway to exceptional investment opportunities. Nicosia, your gateway to the future. We now continue with session six, Vision for the Moon Village Future. In this session, we have presentations on the future of lunar exploration and settlement that our International Program Committee has selected, and a roundtable discussion. Hello everyone, and welcome to session six of the Moon Village Association workshop. So I will have to say good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, depending where you are. So I'm very happy to host uh, this, to moderate this session, which is about the vision of the Moon Village, and it's about the future. Yesterday we had the present, and today we're gonna talk on the future based on the same principles and expand on that for the next um, many tens of years. And uh, very happy to welcome in this session uh, our speakers and um, uh, participants in our round table. It's, uh, I'll go as in the order in, appeared in the program, is Arun Radhakirishnan, Hubert Gross, and John Mankins. We're gonna uh, start the presentations shortly. Uh, each presentation will be 15 minutes, and after each presentation, we'll have five minutes for questions uh, directly uh, to the speaker about clarifying things about uh, uh, their presentations. 
And at the end, we're going to uh, take the opportunity to discuss uh, whatever we want related to uh, the Moon uh, Village um, uh, future missions and uh, aspects that we want to emphasize. So uh, without any further ado, please, um, uh, Arun Radhakrishnan, please get ready. But first, let me say that um, Arun is going to present uh, uh, a topic about ethical and sustainable features of mining uh, the lunar surface. Uh, very interesting topic. I have read the paper uh, this morning, and I believe Krishna will give us a Arun will give us a, a very good uh, summary of this. And Arun is a young professional in space industry. He's a core member of a prominent space technology startup in India. And he's actually enrolled in uh, the master program of Higher School of Economics in Moscow. And he's also working as a consultant uh, for analysis in the upstream segment of the space industry. He has a range of interests, uh, geopolitics, uh, policy, uh, strategy, and philosophy, as I see. And uh, he's an amateur astronomer. Uh, I like that. Maybe he has some cool pictures to show us as a bonus at the end of his presentation. And uh, as I see, he's the recipient of one of India's top presidential honors uh, for uh, scientific in, uh, originality. So we're really looking forward for your presentation. So please keep it in time, um, counting 15 minutes from now, and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the lovely introduction. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and from where I'm from, good night. <laughs> Uh, to everybody, uh, I hope you're all doing well in this rather uh, precarious time. So um, in much of the presentations that we have been having uh, in this conference, we speak about a technical aspect of lunar exploration. So in this presentation, I would like to uh, speak more regarding from an ethical and a sustainable point of view. Now. I do understand that uh, space as such is an engineering problem. And when we consider space, uh, we tend to look at the scientific premise of it. So without further ado, let me uh, start with my presentation. Okay, so we've been having countless number of uh, missions to the moon over the past few decades. So starting with the Luna program, uh, which was uh, envisaged by USSR. Uh, the lunar program specifically had uh, a rendezvous with uh, the moon. I'm sorry, uh, you're able to see my screen properly, right? Uh, it's going off and on. Uh, hopefully, yeah. it'll remain on uh, for more time. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, yeah. You might you might try slideshow this uh, the in the lower okay. right. Yeah. yeah, I'm much sorry, better. Uh, much better. Okay, so um, I had the image on the right to actually break the ice, but uh, I, I think with the small technical inconvenience here, the ice is already broken. So starting with the lunar program where we had a rendezvous, uh, a hard landing and a soft landing on the lunar surface by a former Soviet Union, we've had um, a variety of missions. So starting with the Ranger program, the Surveyor program, but the high watermark of the entire space race would have to be the Apollo program, where uh, you know we send the first humans on the lunar surface. But since the Cold War, we have seen a whole host of nations sending across uh, spacecraft for uh, lunar exploration. So uh, countries such as Japan and the European states, uh, the Changi program from China, the Chandrayaan mission from India, and up until recently, we are seeing a lot of private entities which are coming into this. So I'm, I'm talking specifically about the Lunar X Prize, even though uh, it ended prematurely without a winner, it is quite uh, promising to see that private entities come into the picture. And this is all the more surprising when you consider that uh, it was only uh, during the 1900s, we had the first powered flight and within 60 years, we are sending a man on the moon. So much of the missions for exploration tend to revolve around the scientific premise. And that's what we discussed during these technical conferences. 
but one has to understand that there is always a political and an economic component towards it. And wherever there's a political component, it has to be a military component, which comes into the picture. And uh, that's what exploration truly is about. So when we speak about the economic component, so this was a map uh, which I, a simple Google search uh, revealed hundreds of results. And this is one such map where uh, we are seeing the false color image of the moon, where uh, you are, uh, it shows us where the different deposits of uh, interesting uh, minerals lie. And one such uh, mineral which everyone's quite interested in, and I would say the byword, is actually helium-3. So there's a lot of promise and there's a lot of research starting from the 1970s regarding extraction of helium-3. And it makes perfect sense for us to go about and explore and extract uh, helium-3. But other than the economic aspect of mining on the moon, um, another thing which uh, we also consider are crude missions. So if we were to consider crude missions, uh, it makes more sense for us to explore the permanently shadowed regions of the lunar surface. So the image on the right here, where uh, you are seeing uh, Atkins Basin. So essentially, uh, Shackleton Crater has been, uh, Shackleton Ridge, I'm sorry, has been identified towards the Artemis program for further exploration. And where there's water, there's always promise for, uh, uh, you know, creation of propellants or, uh, you know, set, uh, creation of settlements. But what's interesting is this. So this was a photo which uh, is found on the U Union of Concerned Scientists website. And I find this quite fascinating because back in 1966, we only see, I guess, two, niche, two uh, superpowers having the capability to launch into orbit. Uh, and uh, very few countries who had the capability of, uh, you know, call of uh, boasting that they have satellites. But within the next 40 to 50 years, we are seeing that much of the globe has been uh, littered with uh, uh, spacefaring nations. And it's quite imperative to say that you can just go to eBay uh, today and order of stuff online and uh, create your own CubeSat. So space is something which has become accessible to everybody. But in the premise of lunar exploration, it makes sense that Suppose that within the next few years, we are seeing more and more uh, spacefaring nations engage in exploration of the moon. It, it, it is only logical to think that within the next 20 to 30 years, we might see almost every country who has the capability of space also eyeing for the piece of the moon pie. And uh, that's where pro programs like Artemis show a lot of promise. So as uh, most of you are aware, it is a uh, it is one of the biggest uh, initiatives that we are seeing in terms of lunar exploration with almost uh, 13 states that have ratified the accords as of uh, today and uh, almost eight proposed missions of which four of them are uh, having a very definite timeline. Although the timelines can slip, uh, it is quite promising that uh, the US has engaged with the rest of the world for uh, going ahead with such a, with such a program. And what is interesting about Artemis is that in terms of, so in this slide, we are just seeing phase one, but we get to see that technologies like high power SEP, solar electric propulsion. Now, electric propulsion is something which uh, deep space exploration is no stranger to, but seeing you know more advanced variants of it in terms of pressurized modules, in terms of landing systems. So we see technology being demonstrated at each and every stage of it. And agreements like the commercial lunar payload services. Again, these are uh, packs where uh, NASA is trying to engage with the rest of the private industry is all quite promising in terms of uh, scaling up exploration. While there is a lot of positive things to say about the Artemis program, there is also criticism at hand with uh, many of the international scholars calling it to be quite US centric and bilateral. And the absence of uh, countries such as the Russian Federation, China, India, France, and uh, European Space Agency, all makes it question whether the Artemis program is actually inclusive. And because much of this is bilateral agreements within the ho with the host nations, there is also concerns whether this is, is this actually a US-centric approach towards the foreign policy, or can we see uh, 
uh, you know, other nations actually calling it an equal game. And uh, as you might have heard, the SLS has been a bit of a dinosaur in terms of cost overruns. And uh, this is where we uh, come at. So can we actually consider a free market approach towards lunar exploration, which is not bounded by the whims of world governments? And this is something to think of since there is more private participation coming into the picture. So other than the US, we find that China has a very uh, ambitious and a very uh, pronounced uh, uh, roadmap for lunar exploration. And uh, China, the Chinese efforts will be complemented with other strategic alliances with uh, Russia and also with other uh, uh, you know, allied states. And we see India looking ahead with Japan and joint European missions towards lunar exploration. So we can see strategic alliances coming up on every side of the globe. But then again uh, comes whether there are frameworks which can regulate uh, you know, lunar exploration. So the Outer Space Treaty is something which comes to everyone's mind. And now since uh, time is a bit short, uh, I've only chosen uh, three specific uh, instances of the OST. So one thing that the Outer Space Treaty talks about is that the exploration of the moon is guided by uh, you know, mutual cooperation and assistance. But with the Artemis program, we see that, uh, again, certain technologies are only favored or given to states which have an allied status, which uh, specifically align with their interests. So I'm being critical about the Wolf Amendment here, because as we can see, China has a very good space program, but the absence of the Chinese with the ISS and also with uh, the US efforts, all makes it to really wonder whether space is driven by a geopolitical agenda. And while we talk about exploration, uh, it, it says that it is done for the benefit and interest of everybody. Now, uh, suppose that uh, tomorrow we find a very rare deposit of rare earth minerals on the moon. Now, a company is able to bring this back to earth. How do we devise in terms of sharing the resources appropriately? While this is of much uh, open to much discussion regarding how the resources are owned or how these are shared, there is a good chance for potential conflict to be seen here and also problems to uh, happen. And again, uh, Article 4 of the OST, which specifically prohibits the militarization of outer space, uh, we can see that conventional weapons are starting to be envisaged by many of the nations. And I think the recent test, uh, the ASAT test, is another reminder that uh, nations can go ahead with their own uh, agendas outside uh, uh, these agreements. And that makes us wonder whether national space treaties are actually a boon or a curse. Because when you look at it, Luxembourg, even though it had a commercial agenda towards lunar exploration, and with the US, with uh, the 2015 order specifically uh, legalizing lunar mining and the recent uh, amendment by the Trump administration, while agendas are being put forward towards devising roadmaps for exploration, it really begins to wonder whether these are more you know, in line with your own interests. Because as it may seem that if somebody has a first more advantage, they can literally dictate the terms of exploration. And uh, since this is a technical conference, I figured at least some aspects should be spoken about it. So one thing is lunar dust. And uh, this is something which has been a concern. Now, if a cis lunar economy is supposed to be implemented, there's going to be a lot of issue in terms of dust, which is being triggered by multiple launches. And obviously, we can see conflict coming in when uh, you know dust goes into the other neighbor's side. And uh, people might ask for settlements and for conviction. And then the issues regarding uh, radioactive waste on the moon, specifically uh, regulating uh, the regulation of RTGs. Now, accidents can happen, but when they do happen, what do we do about it? While there are specific uh, protocols and uh, uh, frameworks which are being developed, uh, specifically with the COSPAR's uh, planetary protection policy and the recent uh, developments in the Hague uh, working group, while these are all positive developments, I can't uh, think about uh, one thing which always comes to mind is the exploration of Antarctica. Because while this was carried out with a scientific objective of actually learning our origins, 
uh, more and more exploration tourism in the Antarctic region, which went unregulated, actually caused the risk of contamination. And this is the same thing which may happen if we were to uh, engage with a very long term and exploitive approach towards lunar exploration. And uh, this is something which uh, I was quite encouraged to see the Moon Village Association talk about. But the cultural aspect of exploration also must be considered because 90% uh, of the globe actually believes in a higher power. And when you think about lunar, when you think of the moon, moon is not just a cultural icon, it's a pop culture icon. So we romanticize the moon. It's an object of many uh, literature. And the image on the left is actually a screenshot from the protest at Hawaii, where they were establishing the 30 meter telescope. Now I had colleagues who got trapped into this protest and who were, come, who were saying that the locals were pretty upset regarding uh, the sacredness of the mountain being exploited. And I can't see why uh, the same thing might, may happen when we try to uh, bring about a long-term exploration and say that substances manufactured on the lunar surface are brought back to Earth. There's a good chance that this might open certain doors to conflict. And uh, what is the best way forward? It's always cooperation. And initiatives like the Moon Village Association where we engage academia, industry, and all sorts of stakeholders to clearly follow a set of uh, regulations and guidelines, and most importantly, create technology standards that are global in nature. It actually paves the way for long-term exploration. And as I've mentioned, knowledge sharing and conflict mediation, these are things which need a lot of uh, interdisciplinary uh, advantage that needs to be spoken about. And I think conferences like this are the way forward. So I hope, uh, I, I hope, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I hope there are some easy questions coming ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arun. That was uh, quite interesting. And I have to say specifically for, for me, who comes from a purely scientific uh, background, uh, for us, uh, the more contributions from other countries is always a benefit because everybody offers um, a unique knowledge. Um, then it comes, uh, I guess, a problem if everybody have to claim resources and how you deal with that. Um, but I guess um, you're suggesting um, uh, like conferences like that and sharing knowledge uh, always globally would be a solution towards, um, an action towards solution. Uh, I don't see any questions specified, they're written at least, but I would encourage the other presenters um, Spend a few minutes, maybe ask uh, Arun for clarification on something um, mm -hmm. or, or emphasizing or comment on anything. Okay, I will take that as a no. So let me ask you, um, do you do you think we have um, uh, like a current, ex well, I, I saw the session yesterday, which is, was about the present and pretty much they're trying to focus on establishing laws about um, resources uh, protection and all this. And you presented something uh, also, uh, another important aspect, the culture and how you uh, have to respect that some people, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they have the moon as a god or a higher power, but they don't want anyone else to um, go and kind of um, intervene with their sacred uh, symbols. But what do you think is the most uh, important thing we should focus now for the next uh, long, like a long term period until we have a settlement, uh, maybe in 2045, uh, which I think uh, John will talk to, uh, to us about it uh, later on. So what we should prioritize before just the general sharing common knowledge and uh, being together for the humanity's good and, and so on. Are there any specific guidelines that uh, you're discussing uh, among colleagues that you should prioritize now? Okay, well, um, that's a good question and I hope I can answer it <laughs> when I think about it. Because as I see it, there is a lot of technical discussion which is going forward and uh, various initiatives on the international sidelines, which again, uh, speak about how uh, technology is being prioritized. Certain technologies are being prioritized and developed. 
what I can see is that, uh, like, I'm a scholar of uh, international relations. So we uh, tend to analyze things more from a conflict perspective because we want everybody to get along. Now, suppose that certain countries develop key technologies and within the space sector, there are issues which come in terms of dual use technologies. So specifically uh, space propulsion, while it is not uh, classified as something dangerous, we, we do face issues where uh, ITAR and EAR specifically prohibits certain uh, technologies from being developed. So one thing which uh, I felt that could happen is that while certain countries may have a technological advantage in terms of their economics to actually develop or gain an upper hand in technologies, they might we might come to a stage where you have countries which are at the very top and we have countries which are at the bottom in terms of uh, technology development. And perhaps, uh, I'm just merely speculating, uh, I'm sure that uh, international scholars can give a better comment. There are chances where, uh, you know, this might lead to an unfairness in terms of how we carry about a global exploration. Because as we look at the recently concluded COPE summit, um, there was a big argument which is going be, you know, uh, between developed and developing nations. So specifically uh, developed nations, I think the figure goes like the 15%, the, 5 the top 5% of the population was responsible for 15% of the emissions owing to their uh, you know, lifestyle. And uh, again, there were not many uh, action items which speaks about how you can, uh, you know, like reimburse or help the developing countries to reach the same page of actually using cleaner and better technologies. So I feel that there might be fragmentations, fragmentation in the way technology becomes developed. And as different countries take different approach, we run a risk of alienating these frameworks because each of them have a very different approach towards taking things. And we're already seeing with the Outer Space Treaty, while almost, uh, I believe 104 nations have ratified this. And it's, it's quite surprising to know that no nation has actually violated the Outer Space Treaty. There is still concern regarding the way it is perceived because different countries can perceive it in their own natural, you know, national interests. So I feel uh, more than the technological aspect of it, I feel countries should come forward and they should set about every uh, you know, possible uh, doubts or I would say curtains of uh, disbelief amongst them. Because it was disbelief which uh, created problems in the first place during the space race. Because that led to a problem where you had countries which were almost on the brink of a world war. And uh, more than this, the aspect of uh, knowledge sharing, I also wish that a humanitarian aspect is considered in space exploration. Because uh, the words of Carl Sagan deeply resonate with me when uh, I, I think it was Nixon who had uh, sent that flag up <laughs> the Apollo missions, specifically saying that we wouldn't hurt a lifeless, you know, we wouldn't hurt, do any damage on the moon. Uh, this was at a time when the other side of the world was actually being bombed. So it really begs to wonder whether exploration is done in the greater good of all mankind. So I feel that more than the technological aspect, we should work on ways at which conflict can be mediated and solved okay. and have knowledge is more uh, open. We have to continue. Thank you very much. And we can uh, expand uh, with uh, participation of others. Uh, uh, so, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So the next uh, presenter, uh, Hubert Gross, uh, is, is going to present about uh, Exor's moon base. Uh, like it's an interdisciplinary project. And uh, Hubert is um, it's on his final year of a master's studies uh, in aeronautics and space technology at the uh, Rzeszów uh, University of Technology in Poland. I'm sure I'm reading that uh, wrong, wrongly. Um, uh, so you can uh, then uh, tell us exactly the name of your university. And he's also leading uh, the legendary Robert team, which is a scientific club that builds analog mass rovers for the University Robert Challenge uh, in many countries. 
and uh, his team won some awards and prizes for their innovation and their designs. And uh, you're also a member of InSpace, a group of students, PhD students, uh, who work together on uh, different projects. And you also won some awards with these teams. Uh, so we're looking forward to your presentation. I saw the paper, some cool pictures. We hope uh, uh, that you will show us uh, some of these um, X moon, the moon base uh, you have as a concept study. So please go ahead, please keep it in time, 15 minutes, and then we follow with questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, the name of the university is Zerfuf, uh, <laughs> University of Technology, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, I had to try. Okay, I will share my screen. Uh, can you tell me if you can see correctly? Uh, yes, uh, I, yes, it's it's seen by everybody. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, as George just said uh, before, my name is Hubert, um, and I would like to introduce. Uh, uh, the source moon base project uh, designed by InSpace team uh, for a moon base uh, design contest. Uh, this project took four plays uh, and uh, it's an interdisciplinary project uh, that includes topics from uh, engineering, law, psycho psychology, medicine, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, in today's presentation, I will discuss uh, some engineering uh, issues. Um, our team, uh, in space team, uh, is a group of space enthusiasts from several cities in Poland. Uh, we are students and uh, PhD students of architecture, engineering, IT, biology, law, uh, medicine, and much more. And we are working uh, on projects related to space. Um, and um, if it comes to a project, uh, my main task in this project was to uh, determine the location of the base uh, and design uh, a system to regulate the temperature in the base. Uh, so I will start uh, uh, a few words about location. Uh, which is the South Pole near Shackleton <coughs> crater. Um, and it was chosen uh, because of its proximity of two extremes, uh, areas that are illuminated uh, most of the time. You can see on the map points A and B uh, and permanent shaded regions, uh, PSR, uh, which have never been illuminated uh, by the sun. Um, we marked it uh, on the map and also you can see it on the map on the right and on the map on the left. Uh, the base uh, illumination uh, time plays a key role in solar energy generation and uh, reduces the number of uh, additional batteries uh, the base must have uh, for the duration uh, of the lunar nights. Uh, and uh, our points A and B uh, are illuminated together for eight continuous months uh, and for over 94% of the total time. Uh, and in uh, 2020, point A had an average annual illumination of 81% and point B uh, had uh, the same illumination of 82%. Um, the PSRs uh, allows us uh, to study the moon's geologic past and futures are uh, not illuminated by the sun. Uh, and it can provide future inhabitants with the uh, water uh, that is trapped there in the form of water ice. Um, the map on the left uh, shows uh, our average solar illumination of the lunar south pole. Uh, like, uh, the brighter the point is, the more illuminated um, uh, during the year this point is. Uh, and on the map on the right, you can see um, uh, permanent shaded regions marked with uh, slight uh, gray uh, areas. Uh, and here you can see our bases, base. Um, an actual uh, 3D model of uh, Shackleton Crater uh, was uh, taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. 
uh, and it was used for visualization. So uh, that is like the uh, I think uh, as 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 for uh, student is uh, the best kind of visualization 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 that we can have. Um, uh, the base is located on a gentle hill. Uh, it is separated by a slope from the area that can be hit uh, by lunar dust during rocket and lander landings. Uh, solar panels have been placed at point A, uh, which, uh, thanks to its long illumination, can provide energy even during a standard uh, lunar night. Um, and next, uh, I will tell something about habitat thermal control system. Uh, in the top photo, you can see a simple schematic of it. Uh, the blue color shows the water loop. Uh, the red color shows the heated ammonia. And the green color shows the cooled ammonia. Uh, and in the render below, you can see the base with the uh, radiators uh, unfolded. Uh, and habitat uh, thermal control system uh, is designed to keep the interior temperature uh, within the range of uh, human thermal comfort. Uh, the main task of the system is to cool the interior to an appropriate temperature. Uh, heating of the inside of the habitat is caused by the heat emitted by the human body, exhaled air, electrical equipment, um, and also during the lunar days uh, when the uh, outer layer of the uh, habitat is additionally heated by the sun. Um, uh, habitat uh, thermal control system is a modified uh, active thermal control system used uh, on the uh, ISS. Uh, and um, the primary function uh, of the system is to connect the water loop, uh, which receives heat from the inside the building, uh, with an external ammonia, ammonia loop that removes it. And um, the first thing as a, as a heat exchanger, um, interface heat uh, exchanger uh, transports heat from the uh, inner loop to the outer loop, regulating the temperature in the habitat. Uh, then uh, heated ammonia is transported and pressure regulated through the pump module. Uh, and uh, PM is connected to the ammonia tank assembly, uh, which is connected to nitrogen tank assembly. Uh, and the ATA uh, is used to regulate the amount of ammonia during expansion and contraction uh, due to temperature changes uh, in the outer loop. And the NTA, NTA provides the necessary pressure to force ammonia flow from the ATA into the loop. Uh, additional heating of the ammonia to prevent freezing du during lunar nights is provided by uh, backup batteries charged during uh, lunar days. Uh, radiators, um, RBVM and TRRJ are used to remove heat from the outside of the loop. Uh, the radiator consists of two series of uh, flow tubes uh, used to radiate heat. Uh, and the transfer of the ammonia in the radiator is controlled by uh, RBVM uh, um, so that its temperature meets uh, our cooling requirements. Uh, the TRRJ provides liquid ammonia transfer to the radiator and controlled rotation of the radiator uh, for uh, cooling uh, control by uh, algorithm. Uh, the next uh, really important thing in our base was uh, the um, habitat structure and models that we used. Uh, and uh, the structure of the base is based on inflatable modules. Uh, we decided to use um, modified modules from uh, Bigelow Aerospace because their solutions have been tested in space, uh, as, well, uh, as well as they are able to produce the module uh, we need in a given time. Uh, this module consists of aluminum structure and a thick layer of flexible composite uh, with a thickness of half a meter. And uh, this composite going from the outside consists of uh, carbon fiber, uh, then foam, then another uh, carbon fiber and another foam. And from the inside, the last layer is Kevlar, uh, which is on the inside because uh, it is sensitive to uh, UV radiation. Uh, 
by using this structure, uh, it was uh, possible to achieve a protection against radiation and uh, micrometeor impacts. Uh, in addition, if the module wall is damaged, uh, the, structure, uh, the structure can seal itself. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, on the um, uh, upper image, uh, you can see um, the process of unfolding uh, this kind of structure on the ISS. And in the bottom render, you can see the, the module connector and the finished and disassembled uh, module. Um, like uh, in our case, uh, in, uh, in case of Xorce Moonbase, um, uh, we uh, assume that an ideal module should be 70 meters long and nine meter in diameter. Uh, but such a model not inflated could be made up to 10 meter in length and six meter in uh, diameter, which uh, really simplifies the transportation. Uh, yes, and um, in the picture above, uh, you can see other model proposals from Bigelow Aerospace. Um, as you can see, the inflated ones are very large uh, and uh, it can easily accommodate uh, future astronauts. Uh, below, you can see our modified module. Uh, in the front, we put airlock with a connector that allows to connect one module to another. And above this connector is also a space provided for another connector that uh, can allow uh, to go directly from the upper floor of one module to the upper floor uh, of the other uh, module. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, the modules are transported by rovers uh, on a special platform uh, from the landing site uh, to the base location. Uh, on site, uh, we can place it in designated areas and then unfold it and uh, inflate it. Uh, and then we can print one meter thick regolith uh, onto these modules. Uh, and for this case, we can use mobile 3D printers uh, which minimizes the risks and costs uh, associated with building and transporting material uh, other than regularly. Can you conclude in the next minute, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, and as you can see, uh, here we have another renders. Uh, we wanted to put uh, as much aquaponics uh, as, uh, as we could. Uh, because of um, mental and uh, physical health of uh, the future astronauts. Uh, yeah, and thank you. Uh, if you want to contact us or, or uh, uh, talk uh, with us about uh, the basis or future project, like uh, we're open. Thank you very much, Hubert. That's really interesting. I. Again, I will prioritize questions from our speakers to the presenters. Comments? Oh, yeah, please, John, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm curious with regard to the radiation shielding. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you were going to try to print one meter of regolith on the outside uh, to provide radiation shielding. I'm curious what your reference is to suggest that one meter is enough. Uh, everything that I've seen suggests at least two, maybe three meters will be required to provide uh, protection from uh, massive uh, SMEs or uh, solar particle events or uh, uh, the uh, uh, galactic cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. uh, like. Uh we assumed it uh, specially ah, okay. that uh, we can use one meter cause like yeah, true. Uh, uh, yeah like uh, one meter <laughs> <laughs> no, I <laughs> okay uh, in our base uh, cause uh, like uh, we still have uh, in our inflatable modules we have a half a meter of uh, wall thickness uh, and we have um, uh, yeah, and like uh, in general, we'll have uh, one and a half meter uh, of of the the base wall. But uh, yeah, like it's not only the regolith. We also have Kevlar and uh, two layers of carbon fibers and two layers of foams. So uh, like 
I think that uh, like going into this kind of technologies uh, would be uh, the best for the future cause like uh, printing even uh, a few centimeters of regolith onto the base is like a huge amount of mass uh, that we need to put uh, onto this. So like uh, in, in construction case, it's like, uh, it's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to do this. No, no, understood. I, I appreciate that, that very much. But I think if you, as you go into more detail, if you try to elaborate, uh, you, you really should try to find good references uh, for the radiation protection properties. Because I, I think uh, the, the foam with regard to heavy, heavy iron nuclei is going to do you relatively little good. Uh, and then you'll have to think about the uh, more regolith uh, and anyway, but. Uh, and I guess you should consult the space weather mission so that keeps my field active. <laughs> so, okay, uh, thank you for uh, the questions and the comments. Uh, we can continue with those uh, later in the discussion. So uh, last presenter, but not least, of course, is John Mankins, who uh, actually were really lucky that he accepted to fill in a spot in our um, session. John is the vice president of the board for the Moon Village Association. And uh, he's also a member of the boards for the National Space Society and Space Canada. President of Artemis Innovation Management Solutions and uh, Mankins uh, Space Technology, INC. Uh, formerly Chief uh, Technologies for Human Exploration and Development uh, of uh, Space at NASA. Well, long career uh, at NASA in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I'm sure I'm gonna remember this name uh, from now on when I'm doing proposals because he's uh, the one who had the detailed definitions of the TRL we're using all the time to propose space missions, which is a very important index uh, when you define technology readiness level. Uh, yes, uh, please, John, uh, I, your presentation is gonna be uh, Oasis uh, 2045, the first human uh, settlement on the moon. And we're all years, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, it is a pleasure to be a part of uh, session six uh, and get the opportunity to provide a quick um, update on the work that's being done in the, uh, as part of the architecture studies of the uh, Moon Village Association in 2020, 2021 and going into 2022. Uh, of course, the early visions of the moon go back more than a hundred years uh, uh, to Jules Verne. Uh, and interestingly enough, many of the uh, drivers, the economic drivers for lunar, lunar missions in people thinking about it a century and more ago uh, had to do with uh, lunar mining. Um, of course, today there are new opportunities uh, provided by the validation, the discovery, the validation that there is uh, uh, ice in the permanently shadowed regions and not just water ice, but also other volatiles of potential uh, interest and importance uh, in uh, lunar and cislunar space activities. Uh, as an evidence of this uh, consensus among nations, uh, these are all the space agencies that are part of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Uh, and, uh, and I think this will continue to grow uh, over time. So it's a, a very broadly based interest uh, in the moon and in not being left behind in the in the uh, rush uh, to uh, to to the moon. Uh, I won't go through this uh, in any detail. We started out looking at a series of uh, of um, of scenarios for the moon, and then chose to do a case study uh, beginning in uh, December of 2019 of the first uh, lunar settlement. Um, this study has been uh, organized in the following path uh, with the definition of requirements, uh, the selection of a site, uh, uh, the development of concepts of operations, identification of system building blocks, and then preliminary modeling of that system. Uh, it's all founded on this International Space Exploration Coordination Group, uh, which uh, represents the space agencies I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, two key parameters in a report that they issued in August 
of 2020 is the idea of producing 50 tons of LOX hydrogen propellant per year uh, and to have not less than 300 kilowatts of power generation in tandem in, in support of that propellant production. And one of the things that we've been trying to explore is are these numbers consistent? I.e., uh, is the number of 50 tons consistent with a propellant, not of water, is that consistent with 300 kilowatts? Um, these are the uh, zones <coughs> that have been identified for the case study, including the lunar south pole, as, as was just discussed, uh, the PSRs, um, the far lunar far side uh, with regard to a science observatory, uh, lunar orbit, cislunar space, including the libration points, and Earth orbit. Uh, this is one example concept for ice mining. Uh, this was uh, developed, uh, as I know it, uh, by the um, Colorado School of Mines. In this case, the permanently shadowed region would be directly illuminated and heated, and you and the the um, a bubble used to capture uh, volatiles evaporating from the surface. Um, I think this particular approach has some uh, issues. Uh, associated with it and associated with the uh, science of the permanently shadowed regions. Um, this is an overall view of the uh, lunar south polar region um, as highlighted in the center lower. It is the specific location that was identified for the um, OASIS 2045 settlement concept. Uh, I might mention that the permanently shadowed region that was selected a couple of years ago as a principal target is this diamond-shaped region in between Shackleton and de Gerlach uh, craters. Um, this has now been designated as the Spudis uh, permanently shadowed region uh, in honor of Paul Spudis, a, a very good friend and, and a very well-known uh, lunar uh, uh, advocate who passed away a number of years ago. Uh, just coincidence that, uh, uh, that it is our, uh, our initial target. Uh, and of course, uh, by placing a, a settlement on the lunar south polar ridge, there's also the opportunity to access over time, uh, both uh, uh, de Gerlach and Sverdrup. Uh, I might mention that the, um, the difference in elevation from the highest point in this image from the a uh, lunar orbiter uh, laser altimeter is on the order of five kilometers. Uh, the, the distance up and down from the, the um, edge of um, the Grand Canyon to the floor of the Grand Canyon is only 2,500 meters. The distance from the highest point in this picture to the lowest point in this picture is twice that. And so these are uh, truly going to be staggering uh, uh, vistas, uh, although most of the most interesting views are down in the permanently shadowed regions and of course will be uh, in the dark. And a, a different approach to uh, lunar resource development rather than uh, going directly into the PSRs to do ice mining uh, could be to actually extract the resources um, point by point from the lunar uh, permanently shadowed region and transport it to another location for processing in an enclosed environment. Uh, part of the concept here is to, by, by conducting uh, processing of the lunar regolith in an enclosed environment, uh, it avoids outgassing and the release of volatiles into the lunar um, environment, which would create a temporary atmosphere and might cause issues um, uh, and of course would waste uh, the volatiles. Uh, this is just uh, uh, a topographical map of the Spudis PSR and of the lunar south polar ridge. Um, this is a close-up of the particular location that's being looked at for the Oasis 24 set 2045 settlement. Uh, in particular, these two craters, uh, the virtue with this crater is that it has a view of the earth. Uh, one of the uh, characteristics of that's a, 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 uh, an attractive feature of, of a location to be on the moon is that you'll be able to see home. 
If you're on the far side of the lunar south polar ridge, you will never see the Earth. Uh, and so it, and that is, a, 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 we think, a, a very strong negative for the psychology of people who are at the outpost. Um, but if you put it on the other edge, uh, you can, in fact, see the Earth on the horizon. Uh, and that should be a positive. Uh, just as was mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, our vision is to put the uh, lunar land uh, spaceport on the far side of the ridge from the um, uh, from the settlement location, uh, and to have a uh, uh, the ridge line as a barrier for ejecta that might impact the human operations. Uh, one of the features of this part of the lunar south polar ridge is that uh, there is a ridge line from the uh, crater location to the spaceport location that is at a constant 1,575 meter positive elevation and therefore uh, should be quite convenient for cutting a road that will all be in a, in a terraced kind of uh, embankment. Uh, another aspect, however, is the question of propellants for the spaceport and how those would be handled. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the idea of using a natural impact feature, which is just uh, near or, or in between the, uh, the spaceport and the settlement location. Uh, as you can see in this close-up, uh, this impact feature has several deep holes. Uh, those are always uh, at the 100 degree Kelvin or less. Uh, and the idea is that by uh, developing those, for example, with sun shields, it should be easy enough to keep those permanently at 40 or 50 degrees Kelvin, uh, and therefore be able to uh, produce cryogens without using uh, electricity. So sort of use the natural environment uh, for the production of the cryogenic propellants. Uh, I want to move along and not take too much time. This is just the, uh, the same location, uh, but looking at it uh, with an image from the, um, a false color image from the uh, data from the LRO mission. And you can see this uh, permanent, uh, you can see this uh, uh, shadowed region in between uh, that's, uh, uh, as I said, quite cold uh, and the uh, potential path for a road uh, that could connect all three locations. Uh, this is a metro map of the lunar uh, settlement concept showing uh, a, uh, the, uh, these three locations, the spaceport, the outpost, and the cryogenic propellant depot. Uh, obviously, there would not be a, a metro in the immediate future, but in the long-term future, the idea would be that just like uh, on, uh, on Earth, uh, you want to connect your major areas uh, with the minimum energy uh, and minimum uh, logistics requirements. And so some uh, either above surface or below surface um, uh, rail line would be envisioned uh, to connect uh, these key locations of the settlement. This is a, uh, a framework of a model that's been developed of the lunar settlement. Uh, all of the major functional uh, building blocks uh, have been identified. Uh, I won't go through this in detail again because of the short time. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that the idea is ultimately to get to the point of being able to do analytical modeling uh, using, uh, in this case, a spreadsheet tool to actually determine uh, the key parameters relating uh, the ice mining, the power requirements, the transportation requirements, and so on. This just gives you a listing of some of the system elements that are being modeled. Uh, a number of use cases have been developed uh, looking at the, um, at the potential economic activities that would be of value, things like fuel production and sales, uh, spaceport services, uh, providing propellant for uh, operations and for transfer to lunar orbit, um, providing accommodations and services to lunar visitors, uh, including just as is the case with uh, the International Space Station, including government employees who would be coming and staying at the, at the lunar settlement, uh, perhaps to uh, do research or to um, uh, do a uh, uh, mission to a, uh, or flight a uh, mission to service a telescope on the far side. Uh, this, I should mention the idea is that this settlement is not a national 
enterprise. This settle settlement is an international enterprise and includes both public and private participation uh, and would provide a, a central hub for uh, multinational activities at the Lunar South Pole. Uh, this just highlights one of the use cases, uh, starting with the ice-laden uh, uh, regolith mining and proceeding through a variety of stages uh, to get to the point where a reusable lunar lander is fueled and the uh, lunar hauler system uh, returns the, uh, a, a modular uh, uh, propellant uh, tankage back to a storage location to be refilled with uh, propellants. And then it, there's a whole series of these. I won't go through them. Uh, basically, the variety of business cases for things that could be done in by mid-century. Uh, this just illustrates one of the system concepts that was uh, presented uh, last year at our uh, workshop at, uh, by Yushnoi. Um, uh, this looks at the, uh, the potential outpost there in that one crater. Uh, and uh, identifies uh, energy requirements for agriculture uh, for a settlement of from 40 to 120 people. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to try to go through all of this again because of the time. Um, I did want to mention uh, that, so we're continuing this study next month uh, because we, we, we couldn't fit it in before the uh, end of the calendar year. Uh, next month, we are planning to have a, a focused or dedicated architecture uh, workshop uh, where we will draw together a lot of, of uh, activities from around the world that are related to the uh, development of the, of the moon and the eventual settlement of the moon. Uh, and we would certainly welcome uh, the participation and engagement of others who might like to participate or even present uh, at that meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, with that, I will close and say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. It was uh, really inclusive, I would say, uh, case study. And uh, I'm sure there, I have seen in your slides many, many more details <laughs> that you do have time to, to go through. Um, so uh, I will uh, welcome questions uh, from um, uh, the panel to John. And I will also ask the viewers to post their questions um, in the YouTube uh, channel and we monitor those and we will pass it to the um, uh, presenters and follow discussions on them uh, among us. But please, first, uh, if there is any specific question to John and uh, what he just presented to us. Yeah, I can have a question. Like, um, how many uh, robots, uh, like, uh, can you assume? For for like uh, reliable uh, lunar mining, uh, or maybe uh, like how how many rockets uh, we should send with, with filled with robots to to make this mining uh, possible and uh, maybe um, uh, financially uh, in proper way. So so based on the um, analysis so far and using as the model, um, the work that's been done by, uh, and I'll go, if, may, if I may, I'll go back to it. Um, uh, the work that's been done uh, by um, uh, one of the um, members of the, um, uh, I have, there it is, there it is. Okay. so. Uh, one of our one of our participants is a company called Offworld, and they are actually developing uh, uh, robotics that are about the size of a of a of a flat, a short uh, Volkswagen uh, Beetle uh, automobile, uh, and would weigh about uh, one ton. And what we are currently envisioning is is that, uh, of course, on the lunar surface, uh, you only have one six G. Uh, we are envisioning uh, systems like this uh, in terms of scale, but about 100 kilograms each. Uh, and uh, so about uh, 220 pounds. Uh, and the vision is that these would be EVs, uh, entirely electric vehicles. They would sortie into the permanently shadowed region, go to the designated location, um, 
extract a certain amount of, of regolith that's ice bearing, and then bring it back out of the permanently shadowed region, uh, making a minimal contribution to heating the PSR. The PSR is at, they are like uh, 40 or 50 or 60 degrees Kelvin. And that's why the, uh, that's why the regolith is ice bearing and you want to leave it there. Uh, you, want to, you don't want to disturb it. You don't want to destroy either the scientific information that is embedded in the volatiles. Uh, you want to uh, extract what you're going to extract and use it, but you want to do it with the minimum impact on the site. Uh, and so the idea is it's sort of like uh, bees going out and collecting uh, nectar uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, taking it back to the hive and then doing it again. So between the two sets of operations, the three sets of operations, the ice mining, the transport of the regolith to and from the PSR to the processing location, um, and then finally the uh, transport of propellant and water to and from the processing location for the refueling, uh, it's like 200 robots and, it, and it, uh, on the order of 100 kilograms each. Uh, and so the, uh, the idea is it's a swarm, not a, not a huge truck. Uh, and that way you get the economies of, of production of the robots and the um, redundancy and, and uh, robustness in the operations as well. So it's, so whatever that works out to be, it's a, so if it's hundred kilograms times uh, 200, uh, so it's uh, 20 tons. So three, three Thank flights. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would remind the viewers to post their questions uh, on YouTube. Uh, let me also, uh, before or we can start directly in general discussions, if you like. Uh, but first, uh, let me ask uh, John, um, you, you mentioned about scientific experiments uh, to be hosted in this. Uh, do you have a hinge at the moment of what would be a popular uh, science um, experiment or operation to be performed from these uh, stations? Uh, so, so obviously, obviously, if if the cost of getting to the moon is six billion dollars for two people, nobody's nobody's going to go to the moon. It's it's just not going to happen. Uh, so, so there's a there's an inherent requirement that if there's going to be human presence, and it's going to be extensive, that the cost must come down drastically. So take that as, and I believe that can be done, um, uh, and we'll talk about that more at, the, at this workshop I mentioned. If the cost can be brought down to getting to the moon to be on the same order as our current cost to go to low Earth orbit, what we have seen over the last 20 years of the ISS and before ISS Mir, and after ISS, uh, the commercial stations and the Chinese station, I think there are going to be a lot of countries and a lot of people who would like to send people to the moon if the price is like $100 million. And so the kinds of research, absolutely uh, uh, lunar surface-based astronomy and radio astronomy and the servicing of those systems and so on, not the operation of the telescopes, because that can all be done from the Earth, uh, absolutely biological research. We, we know a great deal about 1G, we have 50,000 years of experience at 1G. We have uh, 50 years of experience, think about that, three orders of magnitude difference, 50 years of experience in 0G, but we have zero experience, a few days at 1,6G in between. So we know nothing about gravitational biology in between 1G and 0G. And so there's a huge amount of laboratory science that can be done that would be absolutely unique in understanding the multi-generational genomic evolution of human and animal and plant species, everything. Um, other laboratory sciences, other laboratory sciences, fabrication, uh, technology development activities, um, uh, the lunar geology. Uh, sortie missions would be a lot easier to conduct if you're going from a settlement to, for example, Aristarchus or to uh, Tycho, instead of coming all the way from the earth. So uh, I think there'll be a lot of uh, business, uh, even more than, than uh, for the ISS, if there's a place to go to and the price is right. 
And so the, I guess the concept of launching rockets from there, it's not uh, something, it's, it's something that is considered uh, also. Sure, sure, absolutely. Exciting times. And I guess to bring uh, the others into the discussion. Yes, Arun, I, had, Arun had a question. Exactly, yeah, Arun, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And uh, it's just an honor to just, just to ask you a question. Uh, so this is something which has been on my mind for quite some time now. Um, since launch cost has been coming down and uh, with the next few years, we see that order of magnitude completely change. Um, does it actually make sense for us to produce propellant on the moon? Say that uh, if I'm able to you know, bring the same amount of propellant from earth with launch vehicles and considering the input costs of you know, pr production on the moon, does this actually make economic sense? I do understand the implications of it, but just from an economic perspective. So, so in, the, in the immediate future, there is one absolute answer when it's absolutely uh, economically viable, and that is going from the lunar surface into lunar orbit. So for that part of the, of the, of the transfer, that one always, always makes sense, because whatever the cost of getting it from Earth, as long as the, as long as the, cost, of, as long as the cost of the extraction and the making the ice and, uh, into water and making the water into gases and all that, as long as that's a reasonable price, energetically, it makes the most sense to use propellant made on the moon to get into lunar orbit. Un until, of course, you can make uh, electromagnetic launchers on the moon. And then you use ele solar electricity to, to launch from the lunar surface and you don't waste your precious water doing it. But for the rest of it, for the rest of it, from um, a lunar orbit fuel depot and refueling is absolutely critical to a reusable orbit surface, surface orbit transportation system. So we know refueling is critical, but your point is really well taken. Uh, ultimately, and I think, I think the, real, the real competition is going to be between um, super low cost transport to LEO, electric transportation from LEO to lunar versus uh, chemical propulsion from lunar to or lunar orbit, lunar surface to lunar orbit, uh, and uh, and given the, the how precious water is going to be, do you want to waste it by burning? Uh, so I, I but going in, in the near term, going from surface to orbit, absolutely. But the trade is still to be done. I'm I'm actually working on it right now. Uh, how do the numbers look? Because um, uh, I I agree with you fully. This uh, the advent of super low cost uh, la launch to Leo is changing everything. And uh, as Arun, and as uh, Arun pointed out earlier, they're not just the economic uh, aspects of it. <laughs> it's also many more things to 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 be sure that um, you, you be as um, clean as possible. We want to avoid uh, derbies to be uh, accumulated uh, in uh, in that in the surface and in actually not only the surface, right, in the environment around you, and also at Earth, because it's going to be a huge trial to bring everything from here. Uh, uh, up there, and and so on. So I, I don't see any other questions from uh, viewers. And um, please, John. <laughs> so so one thing one thing I, I would I would recommend to everyone to to listen to the opening session panel discussion uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, I I did a uh, moderated discussion with um, former ESA DG uh, Jan Werner and uh, current NASA chief scientist, Jim Green. And Jim Green's uh, insights and thoughts about the, in particular, about the uh, science of the permanently shadowed regions. And, um, you know, everybody, oh, the moon has been there forever. We know all about it, yada, yada. But the idea that in these permanently shadowed regions, there is preserved um, material from the ancient earth so blasted off the earth or, or uh, so it's not just from comets, but it's also potentially, it's all the origins of the solar system, but also potentially material uh, like uh, meteorites in Antarctica. Um, if we find pieces of Mars and Antarctica. Well, we could find pieces of earth um, uniquely preserved um, 
in the PSRs and volatiles. And so um, the, the, they're really a precious scientific resource um, that has to be um, uh, careful, using it has to be carefully planned so that we are not uh, destroying uh, an archive of, uh, of, of the Earth's history. Yes, that's a very important point. And besides, uh, I, I also kept some key words from the panel discussion yesterday about uh, motivation, about uh, all this. But of course, the knowledge and how we can learn, learn from other bodies about our own planet and how to protect it. Of course, by protecting other planets as well. And, uh, and uh, yeah, coming from space physics, I always come across the question, why you, why you study space? We live in Earth. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's our surrounding, it's our, it's our neighborhood. We can learn a lot by looking outside what's going to happen inside. And uh, I, this can also bring me back to Hubert's uh, presentation um, about protecting humans uh, up there. The same way we have to act to protect them um, in other um, areas, like even in, in an Earth trajectory. The same way we can protect the communication satellites at Earth. Um, even communication satellites potentially at the moon in a few years from now. As uh, yesterday we have seen uh, presentations about the constellation of communication satellites around the moon to offer uh, the settlement, uh, the people at the settlements, uh, future settlements, of course, um, comfortable uh, communication with their families uh, using FaceTime, Skype, and so on. So there are a lot to think, a lot to learn, um, and uh, of course, always helpful for our uh, day life, even now. So um, I, I would like to ask uh, if, if nobody wants to, to say anything else as a general discussion. Um, how do you imagine will be the future meetings, uh, these kind of meetings, in terms of getting it done? Like you talk about uh, settlements, uh, the moon, uh, about uh, moon bases. And Arun talked us about another aspect of it, uh, who, who protect the right to go there, going safely there, make sure the companies that are in this race, uh, they um, guarantee the safety of the astronauts that they're sending out there and they're not polluting. And, we use recycling um, uh, materials and stuff. So do you think uh, we should continue meetings like this, but even more technical, like take a case study and cover every aspect of it will be beneficial? Um, I mean, because we are experts in different topics, right? Uh, it should be, I think, it's a matter of these days to just sit down uh, with people among every field and see that we cover what we should cover. And I don't know what you feel about it. I, do, I, do you feel that this is um, something to be done? Is it done already? And I am not aware of it. Uh, it depends. It depends. A lot of, a lot of the times that, I, that I've seen when people try to do something that's collaborative online, uh, it tends to either be like this, so you're all talking to each other uh, using relatively new tools, or it goes to something that's a virtual uh, workspace like Slack or something. Uh, but I have, I really haven't seen. Uh, maybe there's a there's a fortune to be made with uh, some technology that does the integration better. I've, mm -hmm. I've been involved in a couple of workshops where people had. Uh, the the video and they had a workspace, but it's really badly done. <laughs> yeah, my, also, my my other feeling is that w whenever we propose missions, for example, to ease our NASA, um, there is always a constraint on the mass. It's really strict uh, on the power you're using, but we never. I, I don't have the feeling that uh, we are actually informed why we should respect all this. Um, what else may come into the game that we need to take care of? For example, I never thought uh, the need of, well, I mean, I, after all these discussions, it's very clear, but I never thought um, I should use reusable sources um, when I uh, launch a mission out there. But of course, it's really critical. And I see that 
uh, international laws trying to be um, formed to make sure this will um, be guaranteed. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to hear your feelings on this uh, as well. Um, uh, I, I heard from John, maybe Hubert and Arun want to expand a bit on that. We have 10 minutes left. We can use it as we like, but I would really like to hear uh, your opinions about future. Don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, if it comes to uh, meetings, uh, if I understand correctly, like uh, how to do it in, in the future, uh, if we will be uh, maybe interplanetary species or, or this kind of stuff, like um, I think that uh, like uh, the presence of the people uh, somewhere like in work, in home, and uh, in other places, like uh, during the the work, is probably the most important thing. And uh, like uh, probably till we don't uh, invent some kind of uh, sci-fi uh, technology, uh, we will uh, we'll have uh, like a big breaks uh, into the uh, like the future development. Yeah, yes. I mean, uh, uh, another thing I, I feel is like when we get to meetings uh, in, uh, in, in my community, at least, um, we're just representing science from scientists. Uh, but in meetings like this today, uh, which is a diverse um, uh, audience and uh, participants, uh, I get to hear things I, I, I never hear in um, my profession. And it's it's directly related to my profession. Um, what about you, Arun? Uh, so um, when you first spoke about the meetings, the first thing that which came to my mind was time difference. Because say that, uh, <laughs> like suppose we are on Mars, there's always going to be a telemetry delay in terms of actually, you know, getting the information, sending it and receiving it. So that's the first thought which came uh, to me. So. I feel that um, like more than, um, I mean, I, I'm studying uh, right now online, um, thanks to the pandemic. So <laughs> for me, uh, I mean, not just for me, I, I think for most of the world right now, and since we are slipping into that uh, uncertainty, uh, how do we ensure that, uh, you know, each and everyone is on the same page in terms of uh, how ideas are being spoken? Because something that was again mentioned in the presentation today is how do we define interests? Uh, when we look into the economic aspects of different people, I mean, people come with a different, uh, you know, HDI, uh, Human Development Index. So, what is interest? What is of interest for me might be completely different to somebody else. Um, that's where I, I mean, at least in India, you know, like people in the cities have a totally different lifestyle to people in villages. So um, I, I think in the future, I think once you know, we reach to a certain standard of living, I'm, I'm sure that pretty much we would be on the same page here, like in terms of how ideas are being shared. And sustainability as a concept, I think it's becoming more of a necessity rather than, I mean, we are forced to be sustainable. Uh, take the case of the low Earth orbit, thanks to you, you know, the launches and with Kessler syndrome coming in. Uh, I don't see the same issue happening with, you know, mining of the, I mean, with future lunar missions. So perhaps, you know, we would be forced to, you know, you know, reconcile or, uh, uh, you know, follow the frameworks that are being put out. But un until then, I think we would all be, uh, you know, within our individual freedom and responsibilities to, you know, deal with it. Yes, yes. Uh... Totally, uh, totally agree with uh, everything. Uh, is there anyone want to add anything as a conclusion, Mark? We have six minutes. So I wanted to, if I if I may, back on the on on an earlier subject. Um, I think it's I think it's extremely uh, fortuitous for. Uh, 
the impact of lunar activities on the public consciousness internationally around the world, that the uh, permanently shadowed regions are at the poles. And, and the reason I say that is if you look at the view from the earth of the polar regions, uh, it's extremely limited because of the oblique angle. <clears throat> there's there's um, a finite amount of visibility. I think uh, one of the reasons uh, that um, the, uh, there's, there's such opposition engendered, for example, to a telescope on Mauna Kea, uh, it's not just that Mauna Kea is holy, but you can see the damn thing there. And so it's, it's offensive to people who find that um, location uh, to be um, somehow sacred. And so you have to, and you have to respect their beliefs and, and take it into account. But the fact that you can see it is, um, is particularly aggravating to, to the people who object. Well, uh, at the poles of the moon, the people from Earth, regardless of how powerful their telescopes are, are not going to be able to see very much. <laughs> and so, and so, and the, um, I think there's there's a um, there's going to be a um, sort of a I think a, not just telecommunications in lunar orbit, but also imaging. We have all these CubeSats that do all this imaging of the Earth. And I think that uh, there's going to be all this imaging being done, watching what people are doing on the moon all the time. So, uh, so it's going to be, uh, it'll be very interesting. Um, uh, on the one hand, you have to be sustainable. But on the other hand, uh, if you're not, if you threw, throw trash out of the window, metaphorically speaking, Everybody on the, on, the, on the earth is going to see it by the next day. <laughs> Your neighbors are all going to be watching you. So I think there will be a natural feedback loop that will drive all of these activities uh, to be aware of how they are behaving because every moment of it is going to be on the world stage. Oh, that's something uh, <laughs> very interesting and good to hear. Um, so uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm actually really glad that we all um, brought uh, the topics of your presentations uh, together in uh, one discussion, and uh, we hear uh, very interesting stuff. Um, uh, we have two more minutes for final comments. If, if nothing else, I would like to really thank you. Uh, all of your presentations were great. And uh, my, my personal feeling is that this is what should be done for the next many years in order to reach the goal. So you presented some really important aspects. Uh, the knowledge is a privilege. We should not hold back to it, but we will always have to respect all the other aspects that may people, not because they're bad, but maybe they're forgetting or they don't think about uh, stuff that um, may be offensive for others due to the diversity, the different cultures, um, different backgrounds. So it's always good to speak up, share knowledge, uh, and um, do meetings like this, and try to consist the panels with diverse people like we do today. Unfortunately, not gender-wise, uh, it, 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 it was not possible to happen. <laughs> but uh, nation-wise, I think, and, and background-wise, um, I think we represent uh, important aspects that we should know for making the Moon Village uh, a real thing. So uh, I think uh, we're at the end of the time uh, for this session, I mean. <laughs> and so um, let's continue tomorrow with uh, more sessions uh, by the workshop. So thank you really, really much. And uh, we'll be in touch for more interesting discussions. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye guys. Bye. Bye bye. With this session, we have come to the end of day two. We continue with tomorrow with day three 
beginning with the presentations of the participating teams of the first MBA CSEO Hackathon. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the day and see you again tomorrow. From Nicosia Cyprus, goodbye. Thank you.